All right, so uh, we're ready for the last session of the day and of real world crypto. All right, so we have uh, blockchains and distributed ledgers, and we have uh, three great talks in that session. So the first one is uh, titled uh, Challenges Cryptographic Solutions with Payment Channel Networks. And the speaker is Pedro Moreno Sanchez, who is uh, just next to me and about ready to go. Now, before I leave the stage, quick announcement. There is a leather Zelda bag. Like, I'm not sure what it is. Could be like some little device here. So if you lost it or forgot it in the bathroom, uh, it will be just right here. OK, with this, I'll just pass it to Pedro. Right. OK. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody. And thank you for attending to my talk, this point of the conference. Um, today, I'm going to talk about scalability problems. So Bitcoin and many other cryptocurrencies have scalability issues. And it, this is because they rely on a decentralized data structure that records every single transaction that happened in the system. This is good because we, it provides uh, um, public verifiability, so we can check all the transactions that happen in the system. However, it requires a global consensus that, in practice, limits the transaction rate to around 10 transactions per second. And this is far from what we have in other systems, like Visa or MasterCard. This scalability problem has been tackled in the community, and we can roughly group the approaches in two trends. One is on-chain, where mainly they tweak the consensus algorithms and protocols to improve the transaction, uh, the transaction rate. The other approach is off-chain. So we use the blockchain as minimum as possible. So we use it only to solve the disputes between users. This is where payment and networks fault, and we have a couple of examples already deployed in practice. We have the Lightning Network for Bitcoin. We have also the Raiden Network in Ethereum, and many other research projects. Some of them are actually implemented already. As you can imagine, I'm going to focus in this second, second approach today. Let me start with a, a little background on payment chain networks. So remind that we have Alice that has some Bitcoins, and she wants to buy some product from Bob. She can uh, open a payment channel for that. In order to do that, she creates a transaction where she transfer five coins to what is called a multi-seek contract, a contract that can be further spent only when both Alice and Bob agree. To make sure that Alice uh, can recover the funds, she let Bob sign the refund transaction that transfer the coins back from the multi-seek contra multi contract back to Alice. When that, uh, when that has been done, then Alice can effectively put the transaction on chain, effectively opening the, the payment channel, and she keeps locally the refund transaction just in case that she needs this later. Once the channel is open, she can use it to perform several transactions off chain. So she can do that by redistributing the coins from the multi-seek contract accordingly. Mind that she wants to pay one coin to Bob, she pays one coin from the contract to Bob, and the remaining four are paid back to Alice. She signs that, and this is a valid payment for Bob, because the only thing that he has to do is to sign himself, but he can always do that because he has his own signing key. Instead of doing that, he just waits for more payments from Alice. And she can do that by accordingly redistributing the coins from the multi seek contract. In practice, the, these payments can be more, com more complex. We can have bidirectional payments, so Bob can pay back to Alice. Uh, we have also revocation mechanisms to revoke old states. And when both of them, Alice and Bob, are done with, the, with using the channel, they can close it. For that, they assign the last state and put it on the blockchain. So we have only two transactions on the chain and many, many, many payments that happen off the chain. This payment, how, uh, this protocol, however, allows only two users to pay between each other. So what we would like to have in practice is a payment be from Alice to everybody else. And for that, Alice could open payment channels to everybody. However, this is really costly because for every channel, she has to lock coins, and she might not be so, so rich. Instead, what we use in practice is Alice relies on a path of open channels between herself and the intended receiver. So imagine that Alice wants to pay to Carol, she first sends one Bitcoin to the, in the channel that she has with Bob, and this will forward this one Bitcoin to Carol herself. Obviously, for this to be used in practice, we need that the whole operation is atomic. In other words, Bob should get the money from Alice if and only if he has actually paid to Carol. 
this concept of payment side network is what is, has been implemented in the Lightning Network itself. And here, they have tackled this challenge ah. of the atomic atomicity by including more conditions on the payment itself. So if Bob receives such an off-chain payment, he can actually put it on the blockchain, not only with his signature, but also he has to solve a cryptographic challenge, which is he's given a value Y, which is a hash value, and he has to come up with a value X, which is a valid pre-image for that hash value. And because Bob might not uh, come up with such a valid pre-image any time or ever, we also need to add what is a time lock, after which the Bob can no longer use the transaction, can no longer put it on the blockchain. In the rest, I'm gonna denote it by this notation, and I denote that Alice pays to Bob one coin if and only if Bob shows some X, such that X is a valid pre-image of Y before some timeout has expired. And now, once we have this building block, we can concatenate several of these has time block contracts to have a payment from the sender to the receiver. Let me, let me show you how it works in this example. So, Carol creates both the value X and the hash value Y, and gives the value Y to, to Alice. Now, Alice can create a conditional payment, condition on this value Y, to Bob. Bob doesn't know the solution, but he can forward a conditional payment conditioned in the same value Y to Carol. Now, because Carol knows the solution, she created it at the beginning, she can show it to Bob to pull the money from Bob, and he can forward it to Ali itself. This is mainly how the Lightning Network works today. And here, there are two key points that should, we should pay attention. The first one is that this protocol requires that the time in the left channel is higher than the time in the right channel. And this is to make sure that Bob has enough time when he receives the value X from Caro to forward it to Alice, to get the money from her. The second requirement is that Bob gets a little more money than the one that he has to forward in the payment. This difference is called the fee, and this is important for him because it's the fee that he charged for providing the service of forwarding payments between the sender and the receiver. So if you haven't got the details, it doesn't really matter. So what you need to understand for the rest of the talk is that there is a system, it's called the Lightning Network, and allow us to perform payments off the chain. They are fast because we don't require to go into the blockchain, into the consensus, to, confir to confirm the payment. It requires some little fees for the intermediary, and at the first glance, it looks secure, so use this has time block contract, and it looks private because, or privacy preserved, because most of the information is not in the blockchain anyway. But this obviously is only at first glance, and in our group, we ask ourselves whether it's actually secure and whether it actually provides privacy, privacy by default. And if I'm giving here the talk, you might imagine that the answer is no for both of them. And the next, I'm gonna show you what uh, are some of the problems that we have with them in terms of security and, and privacy. Regarding security, we, pro uh, we showed an attack which is called the Warhome attack. And the main idea is that an adversary sitting between the sender and the receiver can let the intermediate nodes to participate in the payment and later steal the fee that is supposed or corresponds to this honest node. Okay? Let me show you in the, in the example. So imagine we have a setting in which all the users have already locked coins in these conditional payments, in these STLCs. Now, Caro or, uh, gives the solution to, to Eve. And now, Eve, instead of forwarding it to Bob, he just waits until the timeout of that STLC expires and for, forwards it to Eve itself. Okay? And then the other attacker forwards it to, to Alice. What happens in practice is that Bob considers that the payment has failed, has not been successful, and unlocks the funds after some time out. The adversary pays one Bitcoin to Caro, but he gets 1.3 from Alice. So what has happened is that the attacker can, has got his own fee, but also the fee that was associated to Bob for forwarding the payment. And this in practice is important because this attack takes back the fees for the honest user, which is the main incentive that they have to participate in the network. There are other, also other implications. For example, um, the funds from Bob channel are locked for the whole entire time block duration. That means that he cannot use those funds for other payments that happen at the same time and might have been successful. Additionally, 
Bob believes that the payment was, uh, was uh, failed, was not successful, and he doesn't have a way to blame the attacker for, that, for the attack. He doesn't know that the attack has happened. From the privacy point of view, the situation is not bad. So imagine that we have uh, two simultaneous payments where each Alice on the left wants to pay to each car on the right. And intuitively, what we would like to have is called relationship anonymity. Intuitively, on path adversaries do not learn who is paying to whom. A bit more technical, uh, what we want to achieve is that the adversary cannot distinguish between two cases. One case in which blue Alice pays to blue Caro and green Alice pays to green Caro. And the second case where blue Alice pays to the green Caro and the green Alice pays to the uh, blue Caro. However, if we look how it works in practice, the adversary can link or can uh, deterministically determine which of the two cases we are. In the example I'm showing this slide, he can see that the blue Y, the Y value, is given by the blue Alice and later is forwarded to Caro, to the blue Caro. So he can determine that the blue Alice is paying to the blue Caro. The same manner, because only Y prime is given by the green Alice and forwarded to the green Caro, he can link both of them. Therefore, relationship anonymity does not hold in the Lightning Network either. In this taste of affairs, we are, in our group, we are also uh, coming up with cryptographic solutions that provide or improve the security and the privacy in current payment chain networks. The main observation that we did is it seems that most of these problems come from the fact that we are using the same Y value at each of the hops in the path. So it might help if we have randomized conditions at each of the hops, and we can solve them only when we get the key from the right neighbor. In order to do that, we could add a setup phase where the sender distributes individual randomization factors to each hop in the path. Okay? These are, and with these two main ideas, we are trying to achieve three properties. So the first one is atomicity, which means that if the user writes lock get opened, then he should be able to open the one on the left. In that sense, we make sure that no, no coins are lost. We also want to achieve consistency, which means that if the user won, uh, was able to open the one on the left, means that he had to open the one on the right. In that manner, a users cannot be overpassed and we, uh, we omit or we prevent from the war home attacks. Finally, regarding privacy, a user should learn, should learn about no other participants in the path other than the direct neighbor in the, length, in the left and in the right. Let me show you on the high level how our protocol, which is called anonymous multi-hop blocks, actually work. It works in three phases. In the first one, the setup, Alice provides a couple of elements to a couple of, uh, a table of information to each user in the path. This table has two elements. The first one is this randomization factor that I mentioned before. The second is a condition that puts together all the randomization factors from the users, from the sender to, the use, to that position in the path. Okay. Once we have that, and Alice puts the concatenation of all the randomization factors to the last one, to the receiver. Now they can pairwise perform this lock operation. We will see later how it's, how it's performed, where every user pays conditioned on the fact that they solve the condition given by Alice before. For example, E1 here can get the payment if he can solve the D lock of the element C1. Okay? And they do it from the left to the right. Now, Carol, he was given, she was given the solution for C4 already. So he can directly give it back to E2 to claim, to claim the coins. Now, E2 can use his own randomization factor to de-randomize the key that was got from Carol and forward it to Bob. And every user does the same. So they got a key, a valid key from the right, they, they randomize it and send it back to, to the left. The idea is that conditions look random because they differ by a secret random factor that is known only by each of the users in the path. And a valid key can only be computed if you get the, the valid key from your right name. So I said, I omitted here how the lock contract works. I'm gonna show you it here in this slide. The idea is that there is a public key shared between both of them, Alice and Bob. 
where the, comp the corresponding secret key is secret share between both of them, Alice and Bob. And they perform an off-chain payment and a two-party protocol to create a transaction, a signature of the transaction, which is almost valid. It's almost valid because they need to come up with a value K with which they can finish the transaction itself, or the signature in this case. And this two-party protocol has to ensure two properties. First, looking at this half signature, Bob has to make sure, or has to be convinced that whenever he learns the value key, K later, he should be able to finalize the signature and put the transaction on the blockchain. And from the point of view of Alice, if Bob ever finishes this, the signature and put the transaction on the blockchain, she should be able to ret retrieve the value K because this is what she needs to put it further back in the path for the payment. I don't have time to show you the mathematical details of how it works, but I encourage you to read it in the paper. I tell you that we have three constructions. We show that we can construct such a two-party protocol from any homomorphic one-way function. And we have other two constructions, one that relies on the Schnorr digital signatures and the other one that relies on ECDSA. Perhaps the last one is more interesting because it's compatible with many of the cryptocurrencies today, mainly Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many, many others. Also, this, we have shown that it achieves the security and privacy notions of interest that we are defining in the universal composability framework. And the community has done some proof of concept implementations, not only in the Lightning Network, but also in the KSN Network and the Combi Network itself. Our protocol has also other practical advantages. For example, it reduces the transaction size for conditional payments. Our conditional payment no longer needs the logic to check whether a pre-image of a hash function is correct. We encode this condition in the signature itself. So we need only the verification of digital signatures to have conditional payments. Moreover, perhaps more interestingly in practice, we, our construction allows what we call interoperable uh, payment channels, so interoperable multi-hop payments. Imagine a path in which one lock is in Bitcoin or ECDSA based. The next one is defined in Ethereum, a D-lock uh, based lock. We can still perform a payment that goes from the sender to the receiver with security and privacy. In the last five minutes I have, I'm gonna show you another challenge that has, uh, we have uh, studied in the Bitcoin compatible payment channel networks. By Bitcoin compatible here, I mean those payment channel networks like the Lightning Network that do not support uh, a Turing complete language like Solidity in Ethereum. Collateral is a term that has been used in the blockchain community to determine the, uh, or to denote the amount of resources that we need to perform a multi-hop payment in terms of coins and time that they are locked. For example, if we have a payment that goes over n minus two channels, each payment of k coins has to be locked or we need a collateral of at least k times n, uh, k times n coins, so k coins at each of the n channels. Also for the reason I have said before, the time that the that the coins have to be locked at each channel is staged. In other words, it depends on the position that you are in the path. Just for security, as I said before, for security, you need to lock uh, the coins at one uh, channel a time higher than the one you have in the, in the next channel. Bottom line is that the coins right now are locked too long in a path. And this opens the problem, they open some problem in practice, like the Griffin attack. The main idea here is that the adversary can perform a payment to itself. Where in order to do that, the adversary has to lock K plus some fees in the, in the first hop for a time N times delta. And the last one has to lock K coins for a time delta. By doing that, he forces N minus two channels to lock coins and also each of those coins are locked by a time which is proportional to the position that they have in the path. Therefore, the adversary has a time amplification of n minus two. And this in practice is really important because this delta has been set in the Lightning Network right now for one day. So if the attacker uses a path of seven hops, let's say, coins are locked for seven days for a week. And obviously the attacker can make this uh, attack 
worse by having longer paths or by using several paths for his payment. So the goal or what we would like to have in practice is called, we call it constant collateral. The idea is that we would like to have a payment from the center of the receiver where we have to lock coins, but for a fixed time. It doesn't, the time that you need to lock the coins should not depend on the position of the path that you are. This will greatly reduce the overall time where the coins are actually locked for the payment. This has been shown feasible in Ethereum-based payment channel networks. So they have a Turing complete based contract that actually implements this logic. And if you're interested, the details are in the Sprite's paper. But also in this paper, they conjecture that it's not possible to have such a functionality in Bitcoin. Or in other words, you can have it, you can emulate such a functionality in Bitcoin, but you need to modify the scripting language and enlarge it with more functionality. We'll have a richer scripting language to have such a solution. In our work, we show that this conjecture doesn't hold by providing a protocol, which is called Atomic Multi-Channel Updates, which is fully backwards compatible with Bitcoin. And this protocol allows to have a synchronization of end channels with constant lock time. And it's, this protocol allows to have a, not only multi-hop payments, but opens the door for other applications, like crowdfunding, netting, or the channel rebalancing. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of how the protocol works, and again, the details are in the paper. So imagine that we have a really simple scenario where Alice wants to pay to Carol by, by a Bob. So Alice wants to pay eight coins out of 10 from, uh, that she has with Bob, and then Bob will forward seven coins out of the 30 that she has with Carol. The first thing is, the first phase is called setup, and Alice and Bob split their channels in two sub-channels. One with eight coins that they will use later in our protocol, and two coins, which are the remaining coins in the channel that they might use later for other payments or other functionalities. Second phase, they lock these coins up to a time delta, this constant lock time, to make sure that if something goes wrong in the protocol, they can recover those coins afterwards. And third, which is the main trick or the main point for atomicity in our protocol, is that Alice and Bob will pay from this eight, from these channels with eight coins to, uh, to Bob directly. But they will do it from a fresh address, A5 and B5, which has not been funded yet. So, because this account has not been funded, it doesn't exist, so it cannot be put at this point in the blockchain. Here, I have shown only the case for A and Alice and Bob, but you can imagine that uh, Bob and Carol will do the symmetric transactions. And at this point, to achieve atomicity, we have a multi-input, multi-output transaction in the phase four called enable, where both of them, Alice and Bob and Bob and Carol, put together coins to fund the channels that they created in the phase three. So they first create these unfunded channels to pay to the respective receiver. They jointly fund those, uh, those payment channels. At the end, because at some moment after the time delta, both the locking coins and the coins in enable become valid, there is a race condition. So we have to create a disabled transaction that disable the phase four transaction, and there is only one valid at that point. This is a technical detail, more discussion in the paper. And with that, I would like to conclude this talk by saying that payment channel networks have been deployed in practice as a mitigation for the scalability issues in cryptocurrencies. However, they still present several challenges. Here today, I show you challenges in terms of security with the world home attack, privacy, showing the relation that anonymity does not hold, and collateral, which opens problems like the Griffin attack. We are proposing cryptographic protocols that mitigate them and also uh, open the door for new functionality like crowdfunding or netting. Obviously, however, there are still more challenges. We are looking at them, other groups as well, and we require more solutions. For example, one of those is to have a scalable and interoperable routing mechanism that allow us to find the paths between the sender and the receiver in the first place. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.
Okay, we have uh, time for one question. Uh, please go ahead, uh, just go to the mic. So it seems that Alice needs to interact with every single entity along the chain. Mm -hmm. Isn't this revealing information about commercial relationships between the, the parties with lots of money? In, 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 that seems like information that you might not want to reveal. Mm -hmm. So if they were doing naively, it would be right. So Alice will reveal herself to each hop in, uh, every hop in the path. What they use is an onion packet where Alice sends information to each of the nodes Alator, and they get the information, but they don't know where the information comes mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe one final quick question. All of these improvements that you're describing to the Lightning Network, uh, any interaction with the Lightning Network team, the developers, like mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of them could be implemented, like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we I interacted with uh, Lighting Labs uh, and they had this proof of concept that I mentioned in my slides uh, where they checked uh, that it was actually possible to run the protocol in, in their current Lighting Network. I also have conversation with Blockstream where we have discussed also the Schnorr based solution and what is the advantages and disadvantages with respect to the CDSA. Uh, so yeah, and they're looking into it. Uh, obviously, it always takes time to implement it correctly and put it in practice. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Pedro. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> All right, and uh, we're moving now to uh, the second talk of the session. It's the marvelous universe of arithmetization oriented primitives and uh, Tomer is uh, giving a talk, Tomer. Thank you. So this is a joint work with Abdel Ali, Eli Ben Sasson, Simon de Hoche, and Alan Chepiniak. And before we begin, some background. About a year and a half ago, I uh, spoke to Eli Ben Sasson from Starkware, uh, who told me uh, how magnific magnificent the ZK Stark proof system is and how it is the future of cryptocurrencies. But he also told me that they have a bottleneck in the form of um, not being able to find an efficient hash function for what uh, they need to do. And I find that to be surprising because, uh, you know, as a cryptographer, you always hear about lightweight this and lightweight that. So amongst all this lightweightness, there has to be something that would be efficient for them. But then Ellie told me that they have uh, slightly different design goals. So what they need is a hash function that is secure that operates on uh, field elements and that minimizes the number of field multiplications. And I then immediately cried out, well, AES, because AES is secure. It natively operates on elements in GF2 to the 8, which is a fancy way to say that it works on bytes. Uh, it is well understood, heavily cryptanalyzed, and uh, widely accepted. But as Eli pointed out, it doesn't minimize the number of field multiplications. But it is a good starting point, though, and that is what we did. And I think we all know roughly um, how the AES works. Right? It has a four by four state, and each round has four operations, starting with an S box, um, then shift rows, mixed columns, and an add round key. And it's interesting to observe that all the multiplications, the bad objects that we're trying to get rid of, are limited to the S box. So if you want to optimize, the S-Box is where we should begin. The S-Box itself consists of uh, two operations. First, we find the multiplicative inverse of the input. The multiplicative inverse is the value that when you multiply to the input, they give you one. And that requires 11 multiplications, followed by an affine, mul uh, affine polynomial that requires seven multiplications. So let's uh, crunch the numbers and see the cost. Per S-box, we need 11 plus 7, which are 18 multiplications. In each round, we call the S-box 16 times, so we have 288 multiplications per round. And then, to evaluate one uh, AES-128 um, primitive, we have 10 rounds, which are 2,880 multiplications. And that's the number we are optimizing with respect to. The first observation is that um, zero, um, zero knowledge systems, like the ones we are considering, 
allow for something called non-determinism. We call it non-procedural computation, which is um, a wider umbrella term because it has analogs in MPC. So together, it's non-procedural uh, computation. But going back to zero knowledge, what we do is a verification of a computation and not the computation itself. So for example, if we have a pair of values, x1 and y1, and we want to verify that y1 is the multiplicative inverse of x1, the naive way would be to directly raise x1 to the power 254 in AES, in the field of AES. Those are the 11 multiplications I mentioned before. But we can also just multiply x1 and y1 and see that um, the result equals one. That's what it means to be a multiplicative inverse. So one of those requires 11 multiplications. The other requires one multiplication. I'm, I'm gonna let you decide which one is more efficient. Although one multiplication is not enough, we also uh, need to ensure that zero goes to zero, but in total we have two multiplications instead of 11. So crunching the numbers again, we had eight, 2,880 multiplications. And now the S-box only requires nine multiplications times 16 S-boxes per round times 10 rounds, 1,440 multiplications per AES evaluation, which are 50% uh, of the original cost of the AES. So we're doing well in optimizing. Let's uh, continue with that. We're now optimizing the affine polynomial. The purpose of this affine polynomial is to ensure that when the um, ciphertext is, um, read, is described as a function of the plain text and the key, the algebraic degree of this function is high enough. Uh, otherwise, certain attacks are possible. Um, AES uses an affine polynomial that is good for AES, but we realize that if we use um, particular polynomials such that the exponent is always a power of two, we could get a more efficient computation of this polynomial. Such polynomials are called linearized polynomials. So if we take a low degree polynomial, we would have a, um, a low degree linearized polynomial. It would have efficient uh, computation, but it would be of low degree. What we also realized is that the inverse of such polynomial uh, is not linearized, nor it is low degree. But due to um, non-procedural computation, the thing that I've mentioned before, we can still evaluate it efficiently. So what we did is to take two linearized polynomials of degree four, and we composed one of them with the inverse of the other. The resulting polynomial is of a uh, high degree. It's not linearized, which means that it can't be efficient, efficiently computed, but it can be um, efficiently verified using only four multiplications, two from each polynomial. So again, crunching the numbers, we have nine, Oh, sorry, before we had 1,440 multiplications per AES-128 evaluation. Now, instead of nine multiplications, the S-box is only six multiplications, um, in total give, giving us 960 multiplications, which are 33% of the original cost of AES. Then our next observation is that the cost of multiplication is independent of the field size. That is not the case for traditional ciphers, right? If you work with a larger field, you, would, you will need a larger chip. It will consume more RAM in your, on your machine. But that's not the case here. One, the cost of one multiplication is one. So what if instead of working with a four by four state, we work with a one by one state? Now we don't need shift rows and mix columns anymore because the purpose of these operations is to mix the field elements of the state and if you have only one field element, there's nothing to mix. And we can afford one S-box per round, uh, giving us a cost, instead of 960, only 60 multiplications, which are 2% of the original cost of AS-128. The last thing, right, these are very small numbers, so we still need to determine the number of rounds. And the usual trick for that in symmetric key design is to try all the attacks you're familiar with, see which one reaches um, the largest number of rounds, then add some safety margin, and that's your cipher. And we applied the security argument of AES to this design and found out that we need about the same number of rounds. 
So the resulting algorithm is called Jarvis, and it's exactly the way I described it. The input goes into the multiplicative inverse, then through a polynomial that is a composition of two linearized low-degree polynomials, one directly and the other by in the inverse form, and then key injection, and that's one round of Jarvis. And we put it on ePrint, uh, hoping that um, third parties would cryptanalyze this, and unfortunately they did. And a few, some time later, a paper was published attacking Jarvis uh, using an attack called Grobner basis. Now, this is ironic because I remember uh, speaking to Ellie before we published Jarvis, and he asked me specifically, but what about Grobner basis attacks? And I said, no, these never work on uh, symmetric uh, primitives. Well, it turns out sometimes they do. So back to the drawing board. We need to some, somehow fix this. Um, it turns out that there is a minimal number of multiplications that if you go below that, your cipher will be vulnerable to Grobner basis attacks. Another thing we realized is that if instead, uh, is that if we have a one by one state, it's easy to evaluate the cipher, but getting the output would be inefficient. So we need more uh, field elements, and having more field elements in your state solves both problems. Um, the natural thing to do would be to go back to an M by M state, or maybe an M by N state, like in Randall. But we also saw that having an M by one state, we can get a faster diffusion than AES. Now we know this is called a shark structure, but we weren't aware of that back then. Since we now also have uh, more than one field element, we somehow need to mix them. So an MDS is the natural candidate. And we understood that uh, composing the two polynomials um, isn't as efficient as just alternating between them, which is what we did. And of course, special attention to Grobner basis attacks this time. And the result is vision, uh, our algorithm for uh, binary fields. And that's how it works. It has a vector of state elements. Each element goes into the multiplicative inverse. Then the inverse of a fine linearized, poly sorry, a low degree linearized polynomial is evaluated. Everything is mixed with an MDS. Key injection, and then in the second step in the round, again, a multiplicative inverse. Now the polynomial is evaluated directly. MDS and key injection. While we were working on vision, we were told that there's actually some market demand for uh, the same kind of algorithm operating on prime fields. So we took the same approach, but now um, linearized low degree polynomials are not available because of the properties of the field, and we understood that we have to get the algebraic degree via the nonlinear operation. Again, we're using um, non-procedural computation in raising to the power alpha, and in most cases, alpha should be three. But the high algebraic degree we get from the functional inverse, so the cubic root of uh, the value. And that's rescue, our design from, for prime fields, uh, where it has the same kind of state, one vector of um, field elements. And we start by, um, getting the inverse of the power map, so the cubic root if alpha equals three, then everything is mixed with an MDS, key injection, raising to the power alpha, MDS again, and another key injection. And this is rescue. These two algorithms um, are secure um, and very efficient. They're very efficient in zero knowledge in MPC, and they have an interesting property. So M is flexible, how many field elements you will have in the state. The larger M, um, the less rounds you need. So the number of multiplication remain, re, remains roughly the same um, no matter how wide your field is. That's very efficient for fully homomorphic encryption, which requires that the um, circuit be shallow. And I, well, I was about to invite you to do cryptanalysis on this, but I also got the permission to break some uh, interesting news. Sometime soon, um, it will be announced, so Starkware, Ellie's company, 
um, hired a committee of experts to evaluate the security of all algorithms in this domain, including the ones that Dimitri presented yesterday. And this committee, I, I was asked to be very specific on this, will recommend, um, well, will say that vision and rescue are the most secure algorithms in this domain when used as hash functions with fields of 128 bit in sponge mode, which is the setting that uh, ZK Starks uh, work in. So that's something I'm happy to tell you today. Uh, some housekeeping announcement. Um, in the, in, on Monday, um, Roberto Avanzi opened the parenthesis and forgot to close it, and I feel it in my body, so here's the closing parenthesis. And uh, this is the team that worked on this paper, which you can find on ePrint. Thank you very much. All right, so we have time for one question. So uh, there's a lot of efforts also to do similar work in uh, the setting of secure multi-party computation. Uh, so maybe you would like to draw some connections or uh, point to differences, similarities. So in our paper, we also evaluate these ciphers in the setting of multi-party computation. The, um, the main idea, or the biggest problem is, are the high algebraic degree operations, so the inverse, um, the, the cubic root. Um, but multi-party computation offers masking, right? You can um, shift things to the offline phase and then have a fixed cost online phase. If you do that, these ciphers are extremely secure, uh, extremely efficient also for multi-party computation. I'm also encouraging you to use them in your multi-party computation um, applications. All right. Okay, so let's thanks, Tomer. All right. Okay, uh, now that will be the last talk of this session, detecting money laundering activities via MPC network flow analysis, and the talk will be given by Dimitar Yetzel. Well, we just disappeared. He's coming back. I think. All right. Good. Okay, Dimitar, all right. Please go ahead. Since uh, it's the last talk, I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank all the organizers for this uh, stimulating event this week. So, thanks. <laughs> so, this talk is about money laundering. And I hope that this slide will convince you that money laundering is just much more sophisticated than knowing what, uh, what soap you should use to do it. So. How did it all start? It started uh, with this global, what's called global laundromat. So that, that was a money laundering scheme, one of the biggest known currently, that uh, occurred between 2011 and 2014. And uh, here we're talking about more than $40 billion that were laundered from uh, about 20 different banks in Russia to various accounts. As you can see here, there are about 5,000 companies involved in the, whole, in the whole scheme. There are more than 700 banks in 96 different countries. So that's a really global, global money laundering scheme. And the idea is that money has flown from across these accounts until they essentially became untraceable. So uh, if you look at the statistics, then you would see that a huge part of that, that amount went to, to the UK. And that was concerning about the financial uh, authorities in the UK. And as you can see, recently, the Financial Conduct Authority, or FCA, organized a tech sprint, 2019 tech sprint. A lot of the people who I see in this audience participated at that tech sprint. That was in the summer, in July. And the goal was to design to use privacy-enhancing technologies to detect these global money laundering schemes. So as you can see, uh, Infor, the company uh, who we work for, participated together with Goldman Sachs and Standard Chartered in a team called Secret Computers and uh, won the public's vote aw uh, award for that. So today, I would like to tell you a little bit about the cryptographic solution behind that scheme. So as an overview, 
our goal would be to solve this simple problem, so detect money laundering groups across, globally across multiple banks. And before we do that, let's, let's try to see why this is relevant. So clearly in this global laundromat, a lot of these banks that were involved were imposed huge fines for not being able to detect these activities. Not that they didn't want to detect the activities, the problem was that it was impossible to detect the activities because they didn't have access to the transaction data coming from the different banks, from the other banks in the scheme. So they had a very local view, localized view of the, uh, transaction, of, the, of the transaction going on through this scheme, but they didn't have a global view of that. So the other problem was that transaction monitoring was still a highly manual process. So it, it needs automation even on the level of an individual bank. And then most importantly and most relevant for us as cryptographers is the collaboration across different banks. So collaboration is hard due to that data privacy. So in this, in this talk, I would like to just take some time to, to review what exists in the plain text literature, in the plain text algorithms for statistical versus graph-based approaches to detecting money laundering schemes, and then tell you a little bit about how you could use secure multi-party computation to detect certain relevant money laundering substructures in graphs of transaction network. And at the end, I would say a word about how you can make this algorithm practical. So if you want to look at the overview of the literature, so you have, you have different statistical models that could, could be used to detect money laundering activities, starting from Bayesian models, from temporal sequence matching, so going into decision trees, so ID3 and C45, those were the early decision tree algorithms, and those were applied with some Chinese data, data in China, CBRC is the equivalent of FCA in China, and these algorithms worked relatively well, except that they, well, they worked well as a first attempt, but the false positive rates were still quite high. So then people started using more sophisticated machine learning techniques like support vector machines. So they, they tested it on certain uh, banking data coming, transaction data coming from Chinese banks as well. Here you can see some data, 1.2 million records, 5,000 accounts over seven months. And that obviously improved a little bit the existing decision tree models. And at the end, people also used neural network approaches. So what I'm going to talk about today is a non-machine learning approach to that problem. So that you can see that we heard a lot of talks about MPC and machine learning. So here we want to focus on non-machine learning approaches. And these approaches are actually graph-based approaches. So what you do typically is, as a bank, you analyze your transaction data locally, you detect some suspicious activity, and then you construct a graph out of this activity. And then your goal is to analyze this graph for money laundering groups. That's what we are going to do, except that we will consider the privacy concerns. So let's take a look at a typical banking data. That's a very simplified view of a banking data. So we have, we have a bank, and the bank sees certain transactions. So this bank here is called ZZ. And you would see three transactions, uh, transaction 15 and transaction 2314. If you look at those, what's common is that the source ID of the account of the second transaction matches the destination ID of the first transaction. Moreover, what you see is that the amounts are large and the first amount is slightly more than the second amount. Also, if you look at the timestamp, you see that the first amount, the first transaction was done a little bit before, a day before the second transaction. So that's suspicious, and that the bank ZZ could detect, essentially, out of its local view of the data. So what the bank does is the bank defines certain rule, and that's really how banks work. So we had an interaction with banks at this, at this competition, and they explained to us exactly how they work. So you are seeing that now we have this, this kind of pair of matching transactions going from YY to ZZ. These are different banks and then money flowing out of this account in ZZ into another, a third bank. So this bank sees this kind of leg structure, so we call this a leg structure. And there are all these rules that are defining what it means for the transaction to be a leg. So a bank creates all these leg structures and then the idea is, what do you do with them? 
Obviously, this information is not sufficient. So you construct a graph, and our graph will be the following. So the, the, the vertices will be of the graph will be accounts, and then the edges are going to come from uh, leg structures or suspicious transactions. So we are going to increase the weight of an edge if, so if, first of all, if a vertex is not marked and we see a leg with a vertex, then we add, we mark that, that, that vertex and we add an edge. And any time we see that same transaction from the two accounts, we increase by one the edge. So basically, if you have two accounts among which you have many fraudulent transactions, then that edge will have a higher weight. So we define the weight of an edge. That's simple. And then what's the goal? So the goal is that we would like to, to detect certain structures that are related to money laundering. So there are two simple cases that you can see here. One of them is uh, money flowing from a source to a destination account with lots of intermediaries in the middle. And then you have a second case where money flows from a source to a destination, but through various intermediaries in a linear fashion. So in the first case, you're separating the funds from the uh, source account, and they flow through in parallel through several of these accounts. The question is, can you identify these structures? So you have case one and case two. And uh, of course, there is a mathematical way to quantify how you could, you could measure these structures. Obviously, a single bank is not going to be able to see these structures. So that's the important point. Now, let's take a really simple example. So we take a source and destination on the two ends, and then we have two banks, a red and a green bank. So what you do is you, you have money that gets split between the red and the green, and then that, get, that flows into the destination account doubled. So what you observe here is that if these are intermediary nodes in a money laundering scheme, first of all, the traffic through these nodes is very similar. And then the traffic is large, because you are talking about large amounts of money. So if you, if you draw the adjacency matrix, matrices of these graphs, then the red bank is going to see a matrix that looks like this here. So I guess nothing can be detected from that, that particular matrix. Now similarly, the green bank is going to see that matrix. Now what do you observe if you put together this information? So if you put together the information, then you're seeing that the two rows corresponding to Y and Z are correlated, are highly correlated. So they're, they're similar in this case, but in general, they, they will have a very high correlation. So is it possible that we detect this correlation without actually sharing the transactions of the banks? And the answer is yes, so we can. We can use MPC here. The basic idea is that we take these two graph views, local graph views, and then we secret share them uh, across the two, two banks. And then we let these banks compute. Now, what, what is it that the banks have to compute in order to detect these activities? So here is what. There are two types of scores that you could compute. And the first score is called a balance score. So uh, the idea is very simple. So a node is going to be an intermediary node. First of all, if it has higher than usual traffic through it, and second of all, if the number of incoming transa transactions is, is similar to the number of outgoing transactions. So this score that you see there, it's a complicated mathematical formula, but what it tells you is that it has two terms, one of them detecting the first, the first uh, intuition, and then the, the second one is detecting the, the second intuition. So the, the top level is a harmonic mean, which becomes higher if you have almost equal incoming and outgoing transactions, and down there, you are measuring the size of the, the, the sum of the weights going through these accounts. So that's, that's one possibility. And then the other one, which is even more interesting for our application, is something called structural simil similarity. So here, what you do is you are going to essentially quantify the, by, by using a similarity or correlation between two vertices. So you're going to quantify what it means that the incoming transactions are equal to the uh, outgoing transactions. So that's exactly what you do by again considering uh, something similar to a uh, uh, geometric mean, like arithmetic geometric mean. So here is what you do. The plain text is version now of the algorithm is very simple. So you compute these similarities on the graph 
and then you test whether some of the some of these correlations are higher than a threshold. So that's what people would do in plain text. And then you determine sets of dense pairs, and then after a standard clustering algorithm, you're detecting uh, you're detecting ML groups. So of course this requires a lot of operations, as you can see, inversions and square roots that makes it that makes the computation highly inefficient. So what you do is you, we propose an MPC version that only uses a certain small set of operations. So what we do is we compute the numerators and the denominators, and then we test essentially inequalities without inverting and without square roots. So we're going to square and, and not, not, not having to compute square roots. And essentially do the same. So that's a, that's a, that's a very similar adaptation. And so now we are going to need these three operations, additions, multiplications, and what we call oblivious comparisons. So we are not allowed to expose uh, these, these, these correlations yet. So that's why we need oblivious comparisons. So uh, how do we do that? We do this with uh, essentially some of inference technology that we develop. So it's a uh, secret computing uh, multi-party computation algorithm. Uh, it works with real numbers that are represented as integers, modulo a large power of two. It's suitable for arithmetic circuits, and it's not very suitable for inversions and, uh, I would say, advanced linear algebra. So the security model is what we call the full threshold with offline and online phase, and trusted dealer or honest but curious dealer. And it can potentially be improved later on with uh, verifiability uh, using techniques like oblivious transfer or cut and choose techniques in multi-party computation. So that's on a very high level. What's important is that you have this oblivious comparison algorithm and that works as an input. You take two numbers that are L-bit numbers and that are secret shared and as an output, you get the secret shared predicate of the, of the comparison. So there are two algorithms. There is a naive and there is a divide and conquer algorithm. And the naive uh, has the advantage that sometimes it's faster, it has less communication. But the divide and conquer has less rounds of communication. So for certain ranges, the divide and conquer is the better algorithm that we use. So I won't say much more about this. I'd rather give you some real data to see what kind of sizes we're talking about. So in the text print competition, we, get, we got data coming out of 3, uh, 330,000 accounts uh, and about 1.5 billion transactions. So that's a giant graph, as you can imagine. So you can't handle it. You have to do something else. So then, then about 300K of these transactions were alerted, and then some of them uh, were reported as suspicious activity report, and then some of these accounts are just, were just blacklisted by the banks at the end. So here's the idea of how to make it practical. So of course, we can't talk about adjacency matrices that are 300,000 by 300,000. So what you do is you use a data structure similar to a Bloom filter. You're going to choose several hash functions that are going to hash the number of accounts into a very much smaller set. So let's say you would hash it into a set of size 1,000, and then you're going to basically compress your graph using these hash functions and construct graphs on the um, output of these hash functions. So then, then you essentially uh, test, test similarity for each of these hash functions independently and using that, you could, you could conclude that, that two accounts are going to be uh, similar. So that, of course, has a f uh, probability of false positives, which you have to calculate precisely. That's an open, ongoing project. But in practice, that works quite, quite well. So some estimates on the complexities. So the Beaver multiplications here uh, that, are, that are used for the multiplications in the compu uh, computation of the similarities you can see very large dimension, uh, so you can see very large vectors and, uh, and correlations that are computed. So this is all, this all can be made practical. That's the, that's the final point. Oblivious comparisons, we can make about one million comparisons of 50-bit uh, numbers in less than two seconds and about 100 million comparisons of the same size for less than eight minutes. So you could, you could definitely do these computations in in reasonable time. And now, in summary, what we got, so just to summarize, so uh, we have provided a graph-based approach to 
allow interbank collaboration on analyzing transaction data. So we have had MPC-friendly algorithm to compute structural similarities, uh, oblivious comparisons to detect dense pairs of account, and using standard clustering algorithms to detect the structures that we are interested in. So as open questions, of course, the, uh, one of the main mathematical open questions here is understanding this data structure that's behind. So understanding the probabilities of uh, false positives, which even in the case of Bloom filters is a non-trivial problem, and then also enable verifiability via more uh, sophisticated cryptographic techniques to allow different security models. So I would like to thank you here. And, uh, also, this is the team who worked on that on the info side. <laughs> So we do have uh, time for questions for Dimitar. So please uh, walk to the mic. Hello, thank you. Uh, given that banks such as HSBC were involved in money laundering themselves, to what extent are your techniques resilient against the bank itself conducting money laundering operations? So if a bank itself conducts a money laundering, that's a different question. So the, the, the assumption here in the text print competition was that banks get fined for not being able to detect properly money laundering activities. In general, if a bank is malicious, you obviously can't use it in the graph analysis. So you have to use banks that are kind of motivated by the same goal, which is it's a game theoretic win-win like situation. So the banks want to collaborate. They don't want to share the transaction data. They want to be able to detect the ML activities. So uh, and you trust Goldman Sachs? So, well, Goldman Sachs were interested in not being able to, to detect activities because they would get, so if you look at this global scheme, just as a matter of fact, they were, banks in, in Latvia and Moldova that were actually uh, revoked licenses. So these banks no longer existed after this scheme. It's a like, multi-billion dollar scheme. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the numbers you had. How many parties were involved in the computation? Where were they located? How, what was, how did you benchmark? How did you get the numbers you had on the slides? So how, how did they get the numbers of the, the number of banks that are uh, involved in the, in the computations? The, the timings, the timings you have on the slides. Oh, the, the timings in the slides. So you mean here. Okay, so I should have said that. Yeah, I should have said that, that that's for two and three parties. That's a small number of parties. In this complexity analysis coming before, you have the number of parties appearing in the complexity. So, so and that, that can obviously be improved in the future with, a, with better techniques, but, uh, Case the number of parties here. Okay. In the oblivious comparisons. Thanks. So. Yeah. So it depends quadratically. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. I wonder if you have to do some sort of uh, fuzzy matching when it comes to, for example, name matching. Uh, when it comes to? Uh, for example, when it comes to match uh, names or addresses or those inputs that are, you know, fuzzy in nature. So uh, I see, so here, here we, are, we, we have not looked at that. I think uh, there are some people who were discussing that during the, the, the competition. We ourselves, we have not looked, our assumption was always that essentially the account has a very specific identifier and, and then you, uh, you use that. I, I, think, I think there are, there, there is some research that might be even going on now on that. I'm not sure exactly about who is doing that, but uh, I have heard about fuzzy matching and money laundering. I see, I see. Yeah, because sure. one of the challenges, for example, to determine if a person is on the sanction list is actually to do it in a fuzzy matching, exactly. uh, fuzzy way. That exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I think I have seen papers on that. So I have seen papers on that in the literature. Okay. Even. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, do you have any insights on what happens as uh, money launderers sort of evolve to avoid uh, the detection techniques? So for example, you have that diamond 
shaped yes. flow, and of course the obvious thing is okay, route it through two intermediate banks. Yes, yes, yes. Four rather than, rather than two. So like, what what changes? That's an excellent question. So so we are motivated by 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 that. So so here this is the very basic structure mm -hmm. that you detect. So you are not detecting all possible structures of money laundering with that. Yeah. So you are at least you're having some measures for what what it means for a node to be an intermediary node, but uh, in fact. Currently, I'm even involved in some, some projects that are, that are non-MPC related, that are using other techniques, other secret sharing techniques to detect such, such structures that are more complicated, that have two hops instead of one hop. Okay. So. Uh, does the flow analysis that you're talking about handle clusters of nodes that act like one node that is definitely doing money laundering, but individually none of the nodes look suspicious? Individually, none of the nodes look suspicious. And individually, these nodes, they are accounts at a particular bank. So from the point of view of the bank, that doesn't look suspicious. But uh, sorry, just to clarify. I mean, like, suppose you have two nodes yes. that are collectively operating like a middleman doing laundering. Yes. But the individual transactions don't follow the leg structure that you're talking about. Only when you look at them combined do the leg structures appear. Can you handle that in this current uh, so, so with this, with this technique, you, you will be able to, to handle that. You, you, you may have to modify a bit your local rules that you apply at each bank. As you see, this, this kind of algorithm is very specific to the local rules that are applied at each bank. We learned these rules just by talking to banks. So essentially, we learned about what they are using nowadays. And that doesn't mean that they cannot enhance or like, improve these rules. Thanks. So you're welcome. Hello, uh, thanks for your talk, it was pretty interesting. I'm wondering, you sort of seem to have very ad hoc clustering rules, and they, they have a complicated mathematical structure for, it, for so, we have to do a lot of operations. Yes. I'm wondering if you did a spectral method, then you just need to compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix, and that you can, that the main method is multiplication, and the banks can even keep the, keep the matrix secret, and just have shares of the vector, and, and the main thing is linear. Yes, so that, 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 is a, that is a very good question. We have not tried to apply spectral methods. So typically spectral methods, they are useful for clustering algorithms. So we have not, been, uh, we have not tried to, that doesn't mean that you can't. I think you, 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 you probably can, can be able to use even MPC to, do, to deduce some information. So currently our algorithms were just based on these structural similarities. But uh, spectral methods are definitely helpful. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an area to exploit in the future. Thanks. OK, so uh, let's thank uh, Dimitar again. Thank you. All right. And uh, this brings us to the end of the technical program. So I'd like us to give a, a big round of applause to all the speakers and the 36 sponsors that uh, are with Without their contribution, it would have been impossible like, to run Real World Crypto. And now the final point, I would like a roaring round of applause for Tom Ristenpar, the general chair this year. Uh, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's actually quite a pleasure to uh, help organize these events, uh, one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, just a few announcements, and then I'll let you go to uh, happy hours and other uh, Friday afternoon activities. Uh, so next year, Real World Crypto will be in Amsterdam, so Amsterdam 2021. Uh, the year after that, we'll be uh, moving to Tokyo for uh, Real World Crypto 2022. And uh, after that, we're soliciting proposals for uh, locations. So if you have a uh, location in mind that you'd like RWC to come to, then you should reach out to one of the steering committee members and uh, uh, get some info about how to proceed. Uh, we sent out a survey to the attendees. Uh, it's very short. It shouldn't take much time. But it's really valuable to get feedback from all of you uh, about what we're doing uh, well obviously, uh, but also more valuable to get uh, some feedback on what we're not doing well. Um, and we really take this uh, to heart to try to make sure that this is serving um, all of you uh, super well. Uh, another way to get involved in the community, uh, you are all now members of the ICR, the International Association of Cryptologic Research. And that means you'll be eligible to vote in future elections for the leadership for our nonprofit organization that runs uh, cryptographic, you know, academic cryptographic research. 
uh, conferences and other activities. So be on the lookout for, uh, for that. Uh, finally, just a few more thanks. Uh, also thanking the sponsors that we uh, have been putting up here really helps make sure that we can run this and keep it uh, cheap and accessible for people to attend. So thank you uh, to them. And then particularly we had a, a special um, recognition that a, a person, uh, one of our 2019 Levchin uh, award winners, Eric Rascorla, personally made a donation to support uh, particularly students who are women and under, other underrepresented minorities uh, be able to attend. So I think we should uh, give Eric a big round of applause. And then uh, finally, I think we should uh, thank uh, especially the, specifically the Columbia University Data Science Institute who uh, helped uh, facilitate and uh, host us here at a uh, beautiful uh, venue at Columbia University. The student volunteers who uh, sat out in the very cold lobby uh, to make sure that there were people available to answer questions and deal with any issues that came up. And then the Columbia event staff who I think uh, did a phenomenal job of uh, running a, a very large conference uh, and making sure things ran smoothly. So let's give all of them a big round of applause. Uh, and that's it, so have safe travels, and uh, we'll see you in Amsterdam in uh, 2021. Thank you.